I'm Jim Atwood. I'm the timpanist of the LPO and have been since the very beginning. I moved to New Orleans in 1983 and started with the New Orleans Symphony and then uh, was in the transition. Uh, I was part of the beginning group that founded the orchestra and I was treasurer and I think president a couple of times and just I've been on just about every committee and position there is. Uh, but I enjoy the timpani playing most of all. Uh, I'm Patty Adams. Uh, I play flute and piccolo in the orchestra. Um, I've been a member of the LPO from the very beginning and before that the New Orleans Symphony. Um, I too moved to New Orleans in 1983 and um, have always had a real love affair with the city. Um, the orchestra has been an adventure from day one. Uh, we were in Colorado. We had a little mountain cabin in Colorado, and we always spend the month of August there, and uh, that's where we were when Katrina hit. We watched it all unfold on a little tiny battery-powered TV because we were off the grid at the cabin, and uh, it was it was just uh, everyone has an amazing story for us. It was shell shock, like everyone else. Uh, two days after the flooding. We got a phone call on our little mountaintop cell phone from the New York Times asking about, uh, actually Dan Wakin was the writer, the New York writer, uh, had tracked us down and wanted to know our story and knew that we were connected with the orchestra, wanted to know what we thought the future of the orchestra would be. And uh, I told him I thought sure the orchestra was going to come back. The orchestra is such an integral part of the cultural fabric of New Orleans. There was no doubt in my mind even then that we would find a way to come back. We had come back once before from the New Orleans Symphony to the Louisiana Philharmonic. So uh, I knew we'd be back again. We, we knew how to be nimble. That was our MO. The next thing that happened for us, uh, this was a week or two after the hurricane when we we're still in the mountain, we got a call from a friend in Chicago that offered us an apartment to stay in. So uh, we packed up everything and moved across the country to Chicago. And uh, about the second day we were in Chicago, my phone rang, my cell phone rang, and it was Sir James Galway. I know him through Patty. Patty's been the president of the National Flute Association, so they've had a lot of, uh, done a lot of things together. And for some reason he has my phone number. <laughs> and so he was checking on us. He wanted to know, number one, were we okay? And the second thing he said was that uh, he was in Lucerne at the Lucerne Festival. And the New York Philharmonic had played there the night before. And at a reception, he took Zarin Maida aside, then the executive director of New York Philharmonic, and said, uh, you need to do something to help these people. <laughs> yeah. For Jim and I, we were very lucky. We didn't lose our house. In fact, the first time we saw our house, it was sometime in October, we saw a picture on Google Earth that had been published of the city now. And I just remember my incredible disappointment to see Jim's white Volkswagen van still sitting in the road. <laughs> I had so hoped that thing would have been flooded, but there it sat, high and dry. But our street, because we live in one of the oldest sections of the city, were protected by the levees that are by the river, and so there was no flooding in our neighborhood. So we were able to send our key to various people, so we had uh, a cellist friend move a grand piano into our front room by finding blown off shutters in the road and putting the shutters across our hedge and wheeling the piano up through our front door, and then she ended up staying there for a couple of months. and. So various people were bringing things into our house. Her we, house had flooded. Her house was, had flooded. She had moved her piano. And so we knew we were fine, but at the same time we knew our colleagues were not. Well, the first time we actually got together as an orchestra, as a group, to perform was in early November in Nashville, Tennessee. The Nashville Symphony was one of the first groups to officially contact the orchestra and to want to do something with us. So the first time 
I'll never forget the first time seeing all my colleagues was at a reception before our first rehearsal. And it was an incredibly emotional moment because I would say a third of our members had lost untold amounts of things, their homes, their instruments, music, recording collections of a lifetime. And it was very difficult just to be together there at the very beginning. It was very emotional. And I remember just for myself, just stepping into a bathroom just for a moment to collect myself because I was afraid I was really gonna lose it and uh, take a deep breath and step in and greet all your colleagues. I mean, it was an amazing moment. It was really an amazing moment. And then to get to the hall and finally get to do and arrive at the moment where we're going to do what we know how to do which is sit down next to each other and make glorious music together with these very generous people in Nashville who had offered not only their hall to us, but their own musicianship and their own homes. In many instances, we stayed at the homes of musicians as well. Um, the, uh, they realized early on that we were all gonna get to Nashville. Actually, American Airlines flew all of the LPO members from wherever they were in the country to Nashville for this benefit concert. Uh, but they realized that we didn't, you may have grabbed your violin and your child, maybe the child, when you evacuated New Orleans, but uh, you didn't grab your tails. So we didn't have concert clubs. So the word went out on the orchestra grapevine across the country that every orchestra musician has a set of tucks and tails in the back of his closet that he can't fit into anymore. Uh, grab your old tucks and tails, put them in an envelope, send them to Nashville. So uh, we walked into the second rehearsal and there were all these tuxes and tails laid out on tables and hanging on from all over the country. And including a friend of ours that uh, had been in the orchestra was then with the, uh, the Kennedy Center Orchestra. And she got uh, a lot of tales from that orchestra, including some from the director, the then director of the National Opera, Placido Domingo. And it turns out that Placido Domingo and I are the same size. So, to this day, I wear a set of tails that say, made for Placido Domingo. <laughs> and they fit like a glove. <laughs> One of my favorite moments uh, oh. from when we started playing concerts back in New Orleans. It was one of our very first concerts. It was at Tulane and Dixon Hall, very small stage. Uh, we didn't know if anybody would come, to tell you the truth. And uh, I think it was a concert of Gershwin music, Carlos was conducting. And at the end of the concert, we got this tremendous ovation. We were all just sort of taken aback by that ovation. And as the ovation died down, someone in the back of the hall yelled out, thank you. <laughs> it's a great moment. And then we all started crying. Everybody was crying. And still do. It was a great moment. It's a lot of great moments. And actually, before that concert started, we could see people who, had, who were just seeing each other for the first time. Community. Hugging and, and crying and laughing. And, and we brought that moment of community to people who were really suffering. And, you know, sometimes, well, sometimes it sounds like a cliché. But what the orchestra brought at that moment was the healing power of music to so many people, including the ones playing. And if ever there was a community that valued its musicians, and not just in the LPO, but all its musicians was during that time. Because music addresses things that cannot be said. And the devastation that was visited on New Orleans could only be addressed by its music.